is is um, how how we bring pastors back up to par. And um, a lot of us get in this situation where we've got thinning sods, and, and thinning sods usually mean that we have more weeds coming in our pastures, and it can be an ugly cycle. And, and to break that cycle, we really need an integrated approach. A lot of us are kind of in this situation. We either come back to the farm from, from public work, or maybe we pick up a farm that's been <clears throat> neglected or abandoned for a while. And um, like in this photo, there's a lot of broom straw in those pastures, maybe a lot of weeds. And, and the overall productivity of this pasture is pretty low. And, and tonight's presentation is really gonna focus on what, what we can do to restore the productivity of pastures like this. Whenever we talk about pasture renovation, the first thing that always pops into our minds is, is reseeding. And renovation doesn't necessarily mean reseeding. In, in fact, in most cases, it, it um, doesn't mean a complete reseeding. Um, so, and that's kind of what we want to focus on, not necessarily killing the entire pasture and reseeding it, but what can we do to help make that pasture more productive? And, and that's really going to take an integrated approach. And, and that means things like soil fertility, improving our grazing management, weed control, overseeding legumes into our pastures. And then as a very last resort, uh, a complete kill in renovation of the pasture. Um, the older I get and the, the longer I've been doing this, and I've been doing this for about 20, over 20 years now, the the more hesitant I am to, to recommend complete reseedings anymore. I think there's a, a lot of potential for, for thickening up pastures and improving grazing management and fertility management. And, and that all increases the productivity of the pasture. Uh, reseeding pastures, complete reseeding should really be a last resort. And we'll talk just a little bit about that at the near the end of the presentation tonight. So these are kind of the the topic outline that I'm going to cover as we move through the, the evening tonight. The first one I want to start with is soil fertility. And, and really, this is one thing that gets neglected. We, we often want to overseed pastures with improved forage species. Um, but, but if our fertility is not where it's going to be, chances of those, fertility, those improved species establishing and being productive are pretty slim. So it, it kind of all starts with the soil and getting that base down that base fertility before we um, overseed pastures with uh, improved forage species. I like, always like to start when I talk about soil fertility to talk about Liebig's law of the minimum. And, and what this says is that the level of plant production can be no greater than that allowed by the most limiting of essential plant growth factors. So, so what's that mean in plain English? Well, there's lots of different essential plant growth factors. These are just a few. It could be um, rainfall, it could be soil acidity, it could be nitrogen fertilizer, or potassium fertilizer, or soil acidity um, or temperature can all limit pasture production. Whatever one of these factors is the most limiting, that's going to limit overall pasture growth. And you're saying, why, why is it important to understand that? It's important to understand that because you can't when we think about a soil fertility program, you can't pick and choose what nutrients you want to put on that pasture. You've got to identify which nutrients are limiting and then apply those nutrients so that you'll improve overall pasture productivity. And you can kind of think of it like a barrel and each stave in the barrel can be a different nutrient. Um, and then whatever staves the lowest, no matter how much of those other inputs we put in that barrel, whether it's nitrogen or phosphorus um, or lime, whatever's the most limiting nutrient, that, that barrel can never fill up past that most limiting nutrient. One thing that I always like to remind people of is, is that there's a tremendous amount of nutrients removed by hay. So if we have some pastures that we're, we're cutting some hay off of, we've got to return those nutrients back to that pasture. Every ton of grass we take out, if we look at orchard grass as an example in this chart here, um, 
every ton of orchard grass hay that we take off of that field will have about 50 pounds of nitrogen, about 15 to 17 pounds of uh, phosphate, P2O5, and about 60 pounds of potash. So when we take that ton of hay off, we're taking those nutrients out of that field. And if we start to do the math on that, if we have a good year and, and all of a sudden we're producing three tons of orchard grass hay, we're removing 150 pounds of nitrogen, we're removing about 45 to 50 pounds of phosphate and, and 180 pounds of potash. And you can do that for several years, but, but if you don't replace those nutrients, we'll slowly draw those nutrient levels down and the overall productivity of that pasture or that hay field is gonna decrease greatly. Since coming to Western Kentucky, probably um, the, the biggest issue that I've seen with hay fields has been low potash, uh, especially on very high producing hay fields. So we went on several, several calls to Bermuda grass stands and, um, and the potash level was very low in those stands and that was holding overall production back. The, the point of this table is that if we're taking hay off of that field, we're removing nutrients for that hay and we've got to put those nutrients back on to maintain productivity in that field. Oftentimes when we get a soil test in, we can take one look at that soil test and if we see a low potash, then we, we probably know that it's from a hay field. So let's take a look at the value of those nutrients in the hay. And if we just make an assumption that we're removing 40 pounds of nitrogen, 15 pounds of P2O5, and about 55 pounds of K2O, and it will vary a little bit between field and field and um, diff different forage species, but these, this is a good general uh, nutrient removal rate per ton of hay. And we assume the cost of these nutrients are 40 cents for nitrogen, 30 cents for uh, P2O5, and 35 cents for a pound of K2O. One ton of hay is gonna remove about $35 per ton, $35 worth of nutrients per ton. That's gotta go back on that field. The, the reason I'm showing you this is that, that there is an opportunity here. If, if, we're, if we can purchase hay in, we're gonna get the feeding value of that hay plus we're gonna bring some nutrients into our system. And that's important to remember. Now, the, the value of those nutrients in that hay um, are only as good as the distribution within the pasture. So if we're feeding hay in a pasture and, and we wanna get the biggest value out of those nutrients, then the best thing that we can do is move our feeding points around. So instead of feeding all in one area, and we do like to feed by gates, um, we need to move those feeding points around. And when we do that, we get a better distribution of nutrients from that hay. If we have them all in one spot, we tend to concentrate the nutrients that are in that hay in one spot. and We don't get the value out of those nutrients. We wanna feed hay on our porous pasture. So if we choose a pasture to feed hay on, we wanna choose one that's the lowest in fertility because we're gonna eventually bring nutrients in over time with that hay plus some organic matter and other trace nutrients. Um, and then again, move those feeding points around. And we can also move nutrients um, within and even from outside of the farm. We move them from outside of the farm by purchasing hay and bringing in. And even within a farm, if we're on, on an old dairy farm, for example, we're gonna have the largest concentration of nutrients closest to where the animals were. And that's because the, the manure tends to stay closer because it's more convenient to spread on fields closer to the of the barn. And over time, we'll build high levels of, say, phosphorus up in those fields. If we wanted to, to redistribute some of those nutrients, we could actually produce hay on those fields that have high nutrient levels and then refeed that hay on fields that have low nutrient levels. Just want to mention a little bit about nutrient um, uh, removal in cow-calf systems. If we look at, at the nutrient cycle in cow-calf systems, we, we've got inputs coming into the system in the form of, of any kind of fertilizer nutrients we put on. If we put any kind of manure or poultry litter on, those are bringing uh, inputs or nutrient inputs into the system. If we have clover in our pastures, that's capturing nitrogen from the air and bringing it into our, our grazing system. And then anything that we feed, whether it's a mineral or a byproduct or, or supplemental feeds, 
they're all bringing nutrients into the system. And these nutrients get cycled around in that system. So the animals graze the pasture, then they urinate and defecate and put those nutrients back. About 80% of the nutrients that the animal takes in the front end comes out the back end. So, so we're not removing a tremendous amount of nutrients from the system. In a cow-calf system, our export is gonna be in the form of calves or, or call cows. And if we look at um, nutrient removal from a cow-calf pair, every cow-calf pair takes a, a, about 10 pounds of nitrogen out, um, seven pounds of P2O5 in, in about a pound of potash. So very low nutrient removal within the grazing system. And this was some work that John Laurie did at the University of, of Missouri. So to kind of put this in context, if we have um, two acres per cow-calf unit, and then all of a sudden we're taking out three and a half pounds of phosphorus and less than a pound of potash per acre per year. So those nutrients are being recycled back onto that pasture. Now, what can happen in a grazing situation is that we can get a redistribution of nutrients within the system. So if we have one big pasture boundary here in this example, the animals are gonna, um, are gonna tend to go out and, and graze and then they're going to come, come back to shade sources and water sources. And um, what's going to happen over time is that they're going to pick nutrients up here in the form of forage that they graze. They're going to come back here. They're going to lounge around underneath the shade trees, maybe in the pond a little bit, and get some water. When they get up to go back out, they're going to make a deposit. And over time, we'll get concentration of nutrients in places like shade sources, hay feeding areas, um, any, any area where animals congregate at. So, so what can we do about that? Well, we can subdivide this large pasture boundary into several small pasture boundaries, maybe install some waters. And, and then we're gonna put animals in this paddock here and, and we're gonna allow them to graze. They're gonna have their water source here. And, and instead of coming back and depositing the nutrients around the shade and water source, they're gonna keep those nutrients within that pasture. The smaller we make our subdivisions, the better nutrient distribution we're gonna get within that grazing system. So that's an important part of rotational stocking that we don't talk enough about. And we'll talk a little bit more about the um, impact of rotational stocking on the plant a little bit later in the presentation, but, but rotational stocking or rotational grazing also has an impact on nutrient distribution within grazing systems. So, so where do we start at with, a, with our soil fertility program? And, and the answer is with the soil test. Nothing hard, your local agent can help you with that. Um, they collect soil samples and send them off to Lexington and, and then they get a copy of your soil test results back and they can share those with you and, and help make recommendations for your farm. And, and remember, the soil test quantifies phosphorus and potash, but not nitrogen. Nitrogen is very mobile in the soil and it's very hard to measure accurately. So we don't, we don't actually measure that with the soil test. Um, we, we also measure soil pH um, or soil acidity and uh, make a recommendation for lime based on soil test results also. Um, this really provides a, a baseline for establishing a soil fertility program for your pastures. Otherwise, we're just kind of guessing. And sometimes we don't guess as well as we think we, we are. So it's really important that, that we soil test and then we use that soil test to develop a, a soil fertilization strategy, a fertilization strategy for our farm. In, in soil testing is probably most important when, when fertilizer prices are high because it really allows us to target applications of fertilizer. So we're applying just what we need. Um, we're not over applying one nutrient and under applying another nutrient. We're putting the exact amount on that we need to main, pro, maintain productivity in that pasture. And, and um, we have a brand new soil testing publication out um, in it's targeted specifically for soil testing pastures and hay fields. And if you need one of those or would like one of those, contact your local extension agent. It just came out about uh, right before Christmas. And we'd like to see you sample um, pastures and hay fields every two to three years. If you're in a really intensively managed hay production system, we'd like to see you sample every year just to keep a good handle on how, how your uh, soil fertility is trending. 
just want to mention um, some some important things to think about when you take a, a soil sample in in a pasture. Um, you want to get a representative sample, so I like to see people take at least 20 cores per pasture. I like each sample to represent 20 acres or less. So if you have a, a pasture field that's say 40 acres, divide it into two pieces um, and, and kind of divide it along the line where the pieces are as uniform as possible, and then soil sample each one of those separately. And you want to make sure you sample to proper depth. For hay fields and pastures, we want to be about three to four inches for our sampling depth. We want to avoid atypical areas. And when I say an atypical area in a pasture, I mean any area where animals congregate at. So around waters, around feeding areas, around shade areas, um, and, and so on. Um, generally, in those areas, we'll have elevated levels of soil nutrients. And if we mix those cores in with cores from other areas of the pasture, we can get in a uh, a uh, soil test result that's not representative of the majority of your pasture acreage. And then we want to mix those samples thoroughly and then uh, fill the soil testing bag up to the proper line, uh, complete the paperwork, and make sure to include uh, your crop and, and past history so that the soil testing lab can give you a good recommendation. Just want to mention soil acidity and liming. And, and, um, this is still a major factor in limiting forage production in not just in Kentucky, but in the entire southeastern United States. And it does two, two major things. It reduces the availability of other nutrients in the soil. I'll show you a diagram in, in the next slide. And it also reduces nitrogen fixation in our legumes. So nitrogen fixation in things like clover and alfalfa become much less efficient um, as this whole pH decreases. So when we lime, when we apply agricultural limestone, which is actually calcium carbonate, the same thing that's like in uh, Tums, it neutralizes soil acidity and also supplies calcium and magnesium. Now, and I'll show you the impact that it has on the availability of other nutrients in the soil on the next slide. General guidelines, we, we like to see for most grass clover mixtures, we, we want a minimum pH of six, but somewhere in that range of six to 6.4. If we're getting into something like alfalfa or alfalfa, uh, alfalfa grass mixes, then, then we want to really start out about 6.8. And when we get to 6.5, we need to put a little bit more lime back on there. So this is the impact that soil pH has on nutrient availability in the soil. If, if we look at these bands, as the band gets thinner, that means that that nutrient becomes less plant available. This is pH on the top. This is an acidic pH, and it goes to an alkaline pH. And uh, if you look at all of our major nutrients, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, sulfur, calcium, magnesium, if you look at those, when we're in that ideal pH of, of six to seven, that's when those nutrients are going to be the most plant available. The, the reason I'm showing you this picture is that if, if you take a soil test and you need lime and, and you're on a budget and most people are, are on a budget, you're going to get the most value for your dollar by applying that lime because you not only neutralize that soil acidity, but, but you're also making all the other nutrients in the soil more plant available. So they're going to become more available to that plant. So let's switch gears a little bit and just, just talk a little bit about grazing management. One thing I wanted to mention tonight is all these things that we're talking about, soil fertility, grazing management, weed control, all these could be a separate hour presentation. Um, so what we're doing is kind of hitting the high points of each one of these specific topics. For more information on each one of these topics or more detailed information, make sure and contact your local extension agent. There are great local resource for you. All right, so let's talk a, a little bit about grazing management. And when we talk about grazing management, what we're really talking about is, is helping these guys make the right choice in grazing. Sometimes if we just let them make their own choice when they're grazing, they don't make the best choice for the pasture. So when, when we talk about rotational grazing, that's when we graze one pasture and then we take the animals out of it and put them in another pasture. Um, really what we're managing is two things. We're managing residual leaf area. So that's how close they graze that pasture. The, the shorter they graze it, the longer it's going to take to regrow. 
because we're reducing the amount of photosynthetic area. We can kind of think of that pasture as a big solar panel. And as we graze it closer, that solar panel becomes smaller and smaller and smaller. So it's harder to capture sunlight and turn it into sugars and carbohydrates. We always want to rotate out when the shortest grass is in the pasture is at the right height. So it, as everybody on this um, meeting tonight knows, we, we like to talk about grazing heights, but, but cows, they never get that message, right? So they graze some parts closer, some further. So what we want to do is kind of look at the shortest area in the pasture. And when it gets down to the proper height to rotate those animals out, and some areas will be a lot taller, we need to rotate those animals to, to the next paddock. We want to make sure we leave plenty of leaf area because that's what's going to capture sunlight and fuel regrowth in that plant. And then we want to rest. The second thing we're managing is, is carbohydrates. And, and we manage those carbohydrates by resting pastures between grazing events. And that rest period allows those carbohydrates to build back up. So when a, when a grass plant is grazed off, we're removing part of its photosynthetic area or that solar panel and that plant has to regrow from that remaining solar panel. And the other place it gets energy from to regrow with is, is from carbohydrates that it's stored up. And it stores those carbohydrates up during this rest period. So this period when the animals are not grazing it and it's just able to regrow. The other important thing to remember about rotational grazing is it's really a powerful tool to, ma to manage botanical composition in our pastures. And um, we had a, a really nice presentation at our winter grazing conference on utilizing existing resources. And a large portion of that, that talk focused on using rotational grazing or grazing management to manipulate botanical composition in pastures. So by how close and how frequently we graze pastures, we can shift the botanical composition to or away from different plants. For example, if I have a, a tall fescue white clover mixture and I want to increase the white clover in that mixture, I will graze that tall grass pasture, that tall fescue lower in a little bit more frequently. And because the white clover can handle that closer and more frequent grazing, that composition will tend to shift towards that plant. Now, uh, if I want to increase the tall growing grass, whether it's an orchard grass or a tall fescue, I'll tend to raise my grazing height in that pasture that leave more area on that grass plant. And that will make that grass plant more competitive in that mixture and shift that composition towards the grass plant. So the, the point that I wanna make is, is I'd encourage you to watch that presentation from a winter grazing conference. Uh, the point that I wanna make is that grazing management is really a powerful tool for increasing both the productivity and managing the botanical composition of pastures in, in Kentucky. So I want to talk just a little bit about implementing rotational stocking. And, and like most things in life, it starts, it starts off with having the right attitude. Don't do it because, because I told you to do it or your extension agent told you to do it or your soil and water conservation person told you to do it. You've got to do it because you want to. If, if you go into this and, and you're going to install a rotational grazing system and start to utilize it, and, and you're going in and saying, this is never going to work, chances of you being successful are pretty slim. You've got to have the right attitude. And, and if you have the right attitude, you're going to have problems. You're going to have droughts and floods and, and, and so on. But, but you'll find your kind of your way around those roadblocks if you have the right attitude. One of the things that are key to implementing a controlled grazing or a rotational grazing system is, is water. In, in your soil and water conservation district and your natural resource uh, conservation service can help you um, with some cost share programs to install water and design watering systems for, for your pastures. And, and that's really a, a key part of rotational grazing. If you don't have water, it's gonna be extremely difficult to implement a good rotational stocking system. 
Um, and again, controlled grazing or rotational grazing allows us to manage both the residual height, so how close that plant's grazed, and, and how long it's rested between grazing events. And that's going to improve both the productivity and drought tolerance of that pasture. We, we don't think enough about what happens to that plant when we graze it close. We always look at the top of the plant, but what happens underneath the soil, that grazing management impacts the root system of that plant also. So continuously grazed plants tend to have smaller root systems. One of the first things that people notice when they switch from a continuous to a rotational stocking system is that um, their pastures grow longer into a drought stress and they come out of that drought stress faster. And there's several reasons for that, but one of the primary reasons is that they've got a healthier, more well-developed root system on that plant. So again, good rotational stocking is going to help improve nutrient cycling in our pastures. We're going to get improved distribution of dung and urine within that grazing system. The smaller our subdivisions, the, the more uniform that dung and urine uh, distribution will be. Um, and again, we can manage botanical composition with controlled grazing. So, so people always get kind of worked up about rotational grazing systems because they think they're going to have to go out and, and move their animals every every two days or every day. Or, and, and you don't have to do that. The intensity of that system is going to depend on what you want to do and, and what your needs are. So if you're working a public job off the farm and you want to move animals after church on Sundays, then you set your system up for a weekly move. So that, that's really, really important to understand. That, that system has to be not only good for the pasture, but it's got to be good for you too. One thing that I like to stress when we talk about implementing rotational stocking is to build lots of flexibility into your system. So the, the, the minimum amount of permanent fences is ideal. And, and the reason I say that is that you'll want to change things. And if you've driven a bunch of, of six inch wooden posts in the ground, it's going to be awful hard to change where that fence line was. If you had a, a one line of, of hot poly wire up, it's really easy to move that, that one line of uh, temporary fencing. And after you decide where everything needs to be, then you can put more permanent fences in if you want. The other important thing to think about in terms of flexibility is your watering system. So, so don't think about what you're going to need tomorrow for your water, but think about what you might need in six months or a year or two years or three years. And, and I, I tend to tell people to, to oversize their pipe a little bit, and then if they want to extend their grazing system or put another stock tank in, they've got plenty of flow in that system. All right, let's change gears a little bit and talk about weed control in, in grazing systems. This is always a challenge, and, and I want to just say that I that I'm not the weed control specialist for pastures in Kentucky. I'm I'm a forage specialist. Our weed control specialist is JD Green, and he's got the best information on herbicides. And and I defer all herbicide recommendations to JD. Uh, and if you have a question on weed identification, the best place to start is with your local extension agent. You, you can bring a plan into them; they can help you ID it. If they don't know it, they'll know who to call at the university to, um, to get that plant ID'd. And it's really important to figure out what you've got before you start to spray herbicides on, on that pasture. You wanna make sure that what you're applying is gonna control that target weed. So um, I like to start out always and, and talk a little bit about what weeds are. And uh, often weeds defined as a plant that's not valued to where it's growing. To, to me, the best definition for a pasture is that a weed is a plant that you can't figure out how to get a cow to eat. If, if we really look at pastures, there's lots of different things in that pasture that we didn't plant, but, but cattle still eat. Are those weeds? Maybe, but, but if animals are consuming them, they can just be a part of the grazing system too. We always assume that weeds are low in nutritional value, and that's, that's not true. Weeds are very similar to forages. So as a weed matures, its, it's nutritive value is going to decrease. There's no question about that. So does the nutritive value of orchard grass. 
So does the nutrient value of alfalfa. As a plant matures, the nutritional value goes down. This was a publication put together by Ozia Bay at, at Virginia Tech, and she, she looked at the nu nutritional value of different weeds in the vegetative state. So this is alfalfa for kind of a comparison. It had, a, a, in the vegetative state, a very high crude protein. But look, so did redroot pigweed, common ragweed. Giant foxtail was even high when it was in the vegetative state in terms of crude protein and digestibility. And this is in vitro dry matter digestibility. So that's when we take the forage material and put it in room and fluid from the animal and see what the microbes can digest. The, the point that I want to make with this is that um, just because we didn't plant it doesn't necessarily mean it's, it can't be high in nutritive value. Now the caveat is, is that when we have a lot of weeds in pastures, weeds are, are, are taking up a space where a potentially more productive forage plant could be growing. So while the weed may be not bad nutritional quality, its overall productivity or how much it will yield may in all likelihood be less than an improved pasture plant. So that's got to be taken into consideration also. So let's just talk a little bit about controlling problem weeds and pastures. Um, weeds are, are often referred to as things that take pastures over. In, in, in reality, weeds are, are often a symptom of something else that's gone wrong within the grazing system. If we've got a lot of weeds in our grazing system, we really need to think about why they're there. Often they're a symptom of, of an underlying problem in that pasture. Maybe it's poor soil fertility. Maybe it's um, poor grazing management, or maybe it's a combination of both. But, but weeds are kind of like the good Lord's Band-Aid. If there's a bare spot, spot in the pasture, it's not gonna stay bare long. Something's gonna grow in there. Oftentimes it, it, it's a weed. And, and like pasture renovation, if, if you look at these topics under weed control, uh, you know, a really good weed control program is going to be integrated. It's going to look at cultural things like soil fertility. It's going to look at forage species that are well adapted to where we're trying to grow them at. It's going to look at grazing management. And then as, as a last part of the weed control break program, a judicial use of herbicides. What do I mean by that? Oftentimes, our, our first knee-jerk reaction when we have weeds in our pastures is to apply herbicides. And we've got some great herbicides out there, very effective herbicides. So think about what's going to happen. So I, I've got this great herbicide. I go on. I apply it to a pasture that's full of weeds. I kill those weeds dead. What do I have left? I've, I've got a hole in that pasture, right, where that weed was. What grows in a bare spot in the pasture? That's right, more weeds. So, so it can kind of be like a, a revolving door if, if our weed control program is just based on herbicides. Herbicides are a tool that we can use in a weed control program, but they've got to be integrated with all these other cultural practices. We've got to figure out why we've got weeds to start with and then fix those problems. Okay, I, I kind of want to wrap things up and talk a little bit about overseeding legumes and pastures because um, legumes like clover and alfalfa and lespedeza um, are, are very important parts of sustainable uh, grassland ecosystems. Legumes do a number of different things. They take nitrogen from the air. So the air we're breathing tonight is 78% nitrogen, but that nitrogen gas is not available to the plant. Legumes have developed a symbiotic relationship with rhizobium bacteria. And if you look at the roots of this legume plant, you'll see these nodules. These nodules are, are kind of like little houses for rhizobium bacteria. And they've formed a symbiotic relationship with this legume plant. So they get a place to live. The legume plant supplies them with sugars and carbohydrates or an energy source. And in return, they take nitrogen from the air convert it into a plant available form and share it with this legume plant. Uh, legumes and grazing systems will increase both yield and forage quality. And that translates into improved animal performance. 
we can have improved summer growth, uh, especially for pastures that contain alfalfa or Ceresia lespedeza, which is probably one of the most drought tolerant plants I've ever seen. Um, is it good for grazing? Yeah, it, if it's managed, it can be pretty decent for grazing. And, and in some cases, it's best adapted, especially on reclaimed mine land soils, um, but it just needs to be managed and, and the height needs to be controlled um, so that it stays palatable. The other things that legumes do in, in pastures is it dilutes the toxic endophyte in tall fescue. And we've, we've always used that word dilute, but, but actually new research coming out of the USDA uh, um, Agricultural Research Unit on campus that focuses on forage uh, food animal production is that there's actually compounds in red clover called isoflavones, which actually reverses the negative impact of the toxins in tall fescue. So the toxins in tall fescue cause what we call vasoconstriction or a constriction of the blood vessels in the body, which causes uh, the animal to run a low grade fever. The isoflavones in red clover actually reverse that vasoconstriction and allow those blood vessels to relax again and um, have better blood flow. So, so there's lots of things we're still learning. You know, we think we know all the answers, but there's so much we don't know. And, and this is just another good example of why red clover is such an important part of grazing systems and, and really should be a part of our overseeding program on a regular basis. And, and this is from Southern Forages. And we often like to talk about uh, the value of the nitrogen fixed by different um, legumes. And our most aggressive nitrogen fixer is going to be alfalfa. You know, you can fix up upwards of 250 pounds of nitrogen per year. Uh, red clover is kind of intermediate. And then lower would be uh, ladino or white clover and annual espadiza. And you can put a monetary value on that clover that's fixed. for uh, This is a low nitrogen cost and medium nitrogen cost. And this is a great table, but I, I think it's important to understand that using legumes in the pastures is, is not like throwing a bag of nitrogen fertilizer on there. That nitrogen fixed in that legume has to be shared with that grass plant. And it's not directly shared, it's indirectly shared. And that's a really important to, thing to understand because it, it emphasizes the importance of good grazing management in that pasture. So. The, the animal or the grazing livestock in a grassland ecosystem is a very important part of that system because it's taking that legume, that nitrogen in that legume, it's ingesting it. So it's eating that legume plant and then it's urinating and defecating back on that pasture and indirectly recycling that, that nitrogen or uh, sharing that nitrogen with the grass plant. And we build up over time stronger as our grazing management improves we build stronger and stronger nitrogen cycles within grazing systems. Um, the other way that's indirectly shared with uh, grass plants is through death and decomposition of plant parts, like um, leaves on a plant that would fall to the surface or get trampled to the surface, break down and release that nitrogen. In microorganisms or, or in, and insects and earthworms are all an important part of that, of that uh, nutrient cycling. Um, and also nodules, those nodules that we saw in that legume root, as uh, a plant um, grows, those nodules will slough off and release nitrogen into the system. There's really direct nitrogen transfer between a grass plant and a legume plant. It, it's really facilitated through the grazing animal and then through death and decomposition of the plant parts. So let, let's spend a little time just talking about how, how do we get legumes back in pastures um, and, and several methods for doing that. And, and what I want, want to take you through is steps to, to accomplish this. And, and the first one is that we need to suppress the existing sod. Um, it, and the best way to do that is by close and, and hard grazing prior to overseeding that pasture with legumes. This is really important because it allows that seed to get in contact with the soil. And for a seed to germinate, it's gotta have contact with the soil. And then it reduces shading of those seedlings. When we suppress that sod through grazing it too hard, and this is the only time I'll tell you to overgraze your pasture is when we're getting ready to overseed it with legumes. Um, we can reduce uh, the shading and competition for those seedlings. 
The second step, so we're reducing residue and that allows that seed to get in contact with the soil. Is, the second step is to get good soil to seed contact. There's lots of different ways that we can overseed pastures. We can use minimum tillage or no tillage. Uh, we can frost seed. But, but the goal is always the same, and that goal is to get good soil to seed contact. If we can get good soil to seed contact, that seed's got a chance of germinating and coming up and producing a viable seedling. Uh, the, the first method, in, in probably I think one of the best methods for overseeding red and white clover into pastures is frost seeding. And, and this is right now the perfect time of the year to do it. This is right when we want to get on. We want to make sure that we've got time for the freezing and thawing cycles to, to crack that soil, create those little fissure, fissures um, in that soil, those little cracks, and let that seed get incorporated into the soil. So we simply do it by broadcasting the, the seed onto the soil surface, and we do this in, in late winter or very early spring. And that freezing and thawing causes what we call a honeycomb to form in that pasture. So, so in that, those cracks in that honeycomb incorporate that seed into the pasture. This works best with red and white clover, not so well with grasses and, and alfalfa. Alfalfa is not quite as shade tolerant as our clovers, and it just does not do as well in, in a frost seeding situation. And then grasses, just the, because of their seed, uh, their, their seed size and in, in the shape of the seed, they're just not as incorporated as well as red and white clover, which tend to be round and smooth. So, so preparation for frost seeding really begins that previous summer. So we want to do things that we've talked about already, control weeds. We want to soil test and adjust fertility. And then we want to reduce that residue by hard grazing. And we do that hard grazing usually in, in late summer or fall. Or if we have stockpile, we can actually graze that stockpile close in, um, in late fall or early winter. And that really gets that field ready to overseed with clover. So here's some key tips for frost seeding success. And uh, you want to reduce the amount of plant residue in that pasture. We want to make sure we get that seed on in plenty of time. I like to see people put that seed out in February. That gives plenty of freezing and thawing cycles to incorporate that seed into the soil. Uh, failures can occur when we put that seed out too late and there's not enough adequate freezing and thawing cycles to get that seed into the soil. Um, we want to make sure that we control competition after seeding, and we've, we'll, we've got a little section on that later on that we'll talk about. And then we want to make sure that we use high quality seed of, of a known variety. So we've got well, probably one of the best variety testing programs in the country right here in Kentucky. And um, Dr. Henning's data showed uh, 20 years ago that using an approved variety of red clover is going to give you another year of productivity out of that seed versus a common red clover. We want to make sure that we use the correct seeding rate and that we get even seed distribution. And uh, it, it's important to know how wide our spreader is throwing that seed and then make sure that we're driving close enough so that we don't have a bunch of gaps between our um, spread patterns. And that's kind of where this comes into um, come into comes into play, and and that's these small portable GPS units. It's it's kind of crazy to think about, but you can actually use these on four wheelers or UTVs or even tractors to help make sure that you get uniform coverage when you're frost seeding pastures. At, at one time they were so expensive that it was prohibitive, but now they've really come down in price, and you can buy them for anywhere between $1,200 and $2,000. And, um, and, and I just wanted to take a minute and show you a study that we did here at the research station in Princeton. So what we did was we frost seeded a pasture with either with GPS guidance or without GPS guidance. This first one on the left is without GPS guidance. We did this in four separate pastures. The way we did it was we put the GPS unit on the four wheeler and then we covered it with a bag. And, and my technician just drove the pasture and did the best job he could do. And you can see so, some of it looks pretty good. 
and and then some of it he he either got lost when he was driving on the horizon or or he thought he was driving further apart than he was there was a lot of overlap here when he used gps guidance he had a very even spread pattern over that entire pasture and i'm going to show you some data from this in in, in a minute and then this so that this was the first pasture he did and by the time he got done with the last pasture, so this is the fourth pasture he did, he was starting to get a little bit tired. He just wanted to finish up. And we can see that he had some pretty big gaps here between his spread pattern in this pasture. So, so gaps are, are probably as bad as, as not having, as having too much seed on, on your pasture because you're not getting legumes in those areas. Um, and again, this was that same pasture, but, but done with GPS guidance on that pasture. So this was kind of the results, and and um, it, and really what I want to focus in on is this overlap. So, so with no guidance, the um, we had a significant increase in overlap. If we look at at the no guidance, so no GPS guidance, we had about fifty percent overlap. That's a pretty big deal when you're for frost seeding, especially if you're paying, you know, two two to four dollars a pound for that clover seed. Um, where we had guidance, we had very little overlap in that pasture. Um, guidance had little impact on missed areas. Uh, they were about the same, um, no significant difference. And, and believe it or not, the speed was very similar with and without guidance. So, um, so he apparently had a good, good idea for how fast he was going within that pasture. So just some summary and implications of this little study. Uh, if, if it costs us about 20 or $24 per acre um, to overseed that pasture, the increased cost of seeding without guidance would be, and remember about 50% of the time we're double seeding, is gonna be about $12, $12 an acre. That's a, a pretty big deal. And if we look at the cost of a guidance system, if we say $2,000 for a guidance system, this cost could be recouped in as little as about 165 acres, maybe a little bit more, maybe 200 acres. But, but the point is, if we're overseeding 200 acres of pastures a year or every couple of years, we're going to recoup the cost of that guidance system fa fairly quickly and, and say seed savings from not overlapping based on the data from this study. Now, the last thing I want you to remember about these guidance systems are that they're portable. So, so you just wouldn't use it for frost seeding. You could use it for spreading fertilizer. You could use it for spreading lime or, or grow litter. You could use it for no-till seeding. Sometimes it's hard to see where you've been in a pasture if you're thickening a sand up with some grass. Um, and you can use it for herbicide applications. And, and it transfers between different pieces of equipment. So um, I, I sent your agents a, a draft of a brand new publication uh, that's under review right now at the University of Kentucky, and it's um, focusing on frost seeding recipe for success. So um, they'll be able to send you a copy of that publication, and it's, it's real timely because we should be thinking about frost seeding right now. And it, it goes through those steps to help you have success with your frost seeding. All right, a second method of um, overseeding pastures I wanted to men men mention was minimum tillage. And, and uh, minimum tillage would be doing some disturbance so that we have some soil exposed to get the seed in contact with. And we will start out by again, grazing that pasture hard to reduce residue and suppress that sod. And then disturbing it with some kind of light tillage, maybe 40 to 60% of the sod, light disking, a field cultivator, a pasture drag, some kind of tillage to, to disturb about 40 to 60% of the sod. That does two things. It, it gets some soil exposed for the seed to get in contact with so it can germinate. And the second thing it does is help suppress that sod a little bit more. And then we can broadcast the seed on and, and, um, or, use a, uh, or use a drill um, to get that seed on that soil surface. Ideally, we would come back and either drag it with a pasture drag or um, call to pack it, and that would help get that seed pressed in contact with that soil. 
and um, and then we need to control post-seeding competition. In this picture here, we're not doing clover, but we're actually doing a seed of Bermuda grass in this field. So we came into this field, did light tillage in that field, broadcast that seed of Bermuda grass on, and then um, and then rolled it in with the cold packer. The last method I just wanted to mention was no-till drills, and and this this method takes a little bit more effort and and a little bit more attention to the detail, but but it gives pretty consistent results if it's done correctly because it's actually putting that seed in contact with the soil. And this can be successfully used in both the spring and, and the fall. So this is probably the best method for interseeding alfalfa because alfalfa traditionally does not frost seed that well in the pastures. Um, so we wanna start out and again, suppress our sod and reduce residue. We want to make sure that we don't have a lot of residue on the soil surface because something called hair pitting can happen with the no-till drill. That's where that residue, instead of the coulter cutting it, it actually presses it down into the in into the uh, slot, and the seed can rest in that that basket of residue, and it doesn't have good germination with the because it's not in contact with the soil. We want to calibrate the drill prior to seeding. And we've got a really nice publication on this. It, it just came out. It's called uh, Don't Make a Mistake, Calibrate. And it's a very simple method. It can be used universally, again, across all drill types. And, and what we need to know is the distance between the disc openers and then how many seeds, pounds of seed we want to put on. So it doesn't matter whether it's clover or, or small grain. So, for example, if we want to put 120 pounds of of seed on per acre for a small grain, so two bushels. We go to 120, and we know that our disc opener spacing on our particular drill is seven and a half inches. This tells us that in 150 feet, we want to catch 117 grams of seed. Uh, we can catch that seed by either jacking the drill up and turning that drive wheel, or by measuring out 150 pounds and collecting that seed in a plastic bag from that, um, from that seed tube. A very, very simple method um, for calibrating a grain drill. And, and we also have a really nice uh, video um, on this calibration method that was put together by our ag communications department. And, and of course, it's got a real star in it. That will be me uh, talking about this. This is about a 12, I think, 12 minute video. Well worth your time watching if you're going to calibrate a grain drill. Um, and it uses a John Deere grain drill, but it can be applied to any grain drill, whether it's a hay buster, a John Deere, um, a Truax, it, do it doesn't matter. It can be applied across drill types. Okay, so we calibrate our drill to make sure we're putting out enough seed. The, the next and, and probably one of the most important things to check is the seeding depth. Probably one of the biggest reasons that we have stand failures with no-till seedings is we're putting small seed to four inches too deep. They cannot go deeper than half an inch. Don't take somebody's word for the seeding depth. Check it, recheck it, dig some seed up, make sure that it's putting it at the right depth. A good general rule is if you don't see a little bit of seed pretty close to that soil surface, then, then or right on it, then you're probably going too deep with that seed. These are two interns, uh, Hunter and Jessica, in, and they're evaluating the seeding depth for a field that we're overseeding with some summer annuals uh, in Western Kentucky. And there's little tools like this. Um, I don't ever seem to have my depth gauge with me, so I usually stick my pocket knife in the slit and kind of figure out if it's about right. But there are some nice little tools like this that you can use um, to, to measure your seeding depth. And then the most important thing that needs to happen after we get our seeding depth right and those seedlings come up is that we need to control competition after seeding. Uh, one of the biggest, one of the biggest reasons that we get stand failures is seeding depth, and the, probably the second biggest is not controlling competition after seeding. Um, if we let that sod get out of control and, and get around those little seedlings, they'll shade them out and they'll never come, become established. So step four is to control post-seeding competition. 
And this often determines the success and failure of, of, um, of newly seeded uh, forages. Seedlings just can't tolerate competition for light and water, especially light. So we, what we want to do is keep that canopy open, and we do that by, by grazing is, is the ideal way to do that. Can do it by clipping, but grazing is the best way. And, and everybody's worried, oh my gosh, if I put my cattle in there and they start to graze it, they're going to graze some of the seedlings off and they're going to walk on them. If, if we don't control that competition, and that's all true, if we don't, but if we don't control that competition, we're going to have a stand failure. So we need to let those animals graze. And the best way to do it is just after you overseed that pasture, whether it's frost seeding or no-tilling, just leave the animals in that paddock, feed some hay in there. Um, but let them graze that that grass as it as it starts to grow in the spring, and um, and when the seedlings get tall enough to germinate, and they get tall enough, and the animals start to clip them off, move those animals to another pasture. Let those plants reach a height of six to eight inches, and then you can put that pasture back in rotation. All right, I'm just going to finish up with my pasture um, called Resurrection Checklist. Getting close to Easter, I guess. And uh, we want to soil test and adjust fertility. We want to choose adapted forage species. So, so make sure whether, whether you're introducing more grasses or legumes into your pastures, make sure they're good varieties. Make sure they've been tested in Kentucky and make sure they're adapted to where you're trying to grow them at. Just because alfalfa is adapted to Kentucky and we've got good varieties for Kentucky doesn't mean it's going to grow real well on bottom land that's poorly drained. So we've got to make sure that what we're trying to grow there is, is adapted to both the region and the particular microclimate or soils on your farm. We want to implement rotational stocking in our pastures. That's a great way to, um, to improve pasture productivity. And, and start that renovation process. We want to control broadleaf weeds. And remember, all these other things, raising management, soil fertility, and so forth, are all part of a good uh, weed control program. We want to incorporate legumes back into our pastures. And we want to reseed our pastures only in extreme cases. In, in one extreme case, maybe, if we wanted to convert a toxic tall fescue pasture into a novel endophyte tall fescue. So if we're having real problems with tall fescue toxicosis, we want to get rid of that pasture. That may be a good reason to reseed that pasture. Always important to consider the, the slope of that pasture. We just should not be killing fescue on really sloping areas. There, it's there for a reason. It's there to protect that soil. Um, now, if it's flatter field, then, then it may be, a, may be an option. The last thing I'm going to leave you with is that as we improve our, our pasture management, soil fertility, grazing management, and so forth, it, we're going to see improvements in our pastures, but it doesn't happen overnight. And in today's world, we're, we're very impatient. I don't even like to leave a message for people anymore when I call them. I don't want to talk to them. I call them on their cell phone because I want to talk to them right now. And, and we have to be patient with grazing systems. To bring about really measurable change in that grazing system, it's going to take two or three or four years of improved management to, to see those big differences. So it's important that you set your goals, you figure out what you want to do and make your plans, and then you implement them and you stay on course. And you just be patient and good things are going to happen. I guarantee it. All right. I'm officially done with my presentation. I'd be happy to answer any questions now if there's any questions that have come across the chat. You can unmute yourself and uh, ask it directly or you can type it in the chat box, either one. That's a great presentation, Chris. Thank you. I'm going to get out of here and um, stop my screen sharing here. Okay. Is there any questions? 
I appreciated the the uh, subdividing the the pastures. That was uh, an interesting thought. So I'm I'm always available to answer questions. I I always like for people to go to their extension agent number one and because uh, they've got great local knowledge and uh, can get you pointed in the right direction. You're, you're always welcome to call me or email me and and I like to include your extension agent in the reply if that's all right with you. So. Very good. Well, Chris, thank you for coming on tonight. We appreciate it very much. And uh, we know that our people uh, that were on here tonight are folks that uh, would be the kind that would implement this. So uh, we think it will pay off. Thank you uh, for taking the time to be with us. Um, My pleasure. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you guys for inviting me. Thank you. Uh, okay. Jeremy, we, we canceled the one for Thursday, I believe. Uh, that's going to be rescheduled uh, for later in the, the season. And we've not been able to get the replacement uh, filled in that spot. So Thursday will be open. What do we have for Tuesday and Thursday of next week? For Tuesday and Thursday of next week, it looks like we have winter wood ID for Tuesday. And Phil may uh, want to elaborate more on that. And then also we have uh, turf grass for Thursday. Very good. Well, folks, thank you for tuning in. We hope you have a, a good warm evening. And uh, maybe if you got a fireplace to go sit next to, that'd be a, a good thing to do. Have a good evening, and uh, we'll see you next time.